Thank you very much for the very generous introduction. I feel slightly under pressure now. Um, perhaps rather than a trajectory, this talk in, and this project, the wider project to which it belongs, kind of take me back to where I began uh, with my undergraduate dissertation and my master's dissertation on uh, different versions of a particular Jataka story, in that case, the story of the merchant Singhala who is shipwrecked on an island of demonesses and escapes with the help of a flying horse, a story many of you will know. And this whole idea of comparing Jatakas and thinking about Jatakas across different parts of the Buddhist world is kind of going back to that and also um, picking up an opportunity made available by um, a, a prize from the Leverhulme Trust to dip my toe into some digital humanities, which is new to me, uh, as is working with visual culture. So I hope you'll be gentle and supportive and I'm really looking forward to your input at the end as well. So, if you wander around the Great Stupa at Sanchi in Madhya Pradesh, which I'm sure many of you have visited, I have to confess I have not, but I hope to very soon, uh, you will find several Jataka stories depicted on the elaborately carved gateways. So, on the southern pillar uh, of the western gateway, for example, you'll find a celebrated image of the Mahakapi Jataka, uh, in which the Bodhisattva is a monkey king who makes his body into a bridge in order to save uh, his troop from a human king before then giving a sermon to that king. So you can see that one up on the left. Uh, just across from that, you'll find uh, a similar sized image depicting the Sama or Shama Jataka, in which the Bodhisattva looks after his uh, old and blind parents um, before being shot by a king. Kings are bad in these stories, you may have noticed already. Uh, the story of the extraordinary generous Prince Vaisantara or Vishvantara, also known as Sudana, which has long been acknowledged as a, a very important Jataka in the Buddhist world, occupies both faces of an entire uh, architrave at Sanchi. I should have said at the beginning, a Jataka story, just in case you don't know, the story of the past life of the Buddha. And then there are three separate architraves on three separate gateways at Sanchi that depict, or so we are told, uh, the Jataka story of Chadanta or Chadanta, who is the six-tusked elephant Bodhisattva, who gives away his tusks to a hunter. And the hunter has been sent to get these tusks by a human reincarnation of the elephant's jealous former wife. You'll, you'll get this. There'll be more on the story in a moment. One of the intriguing things about these three depictions is they don't offer any narrative sequence. So uh, each of them is a separate depiction on separate gateways. Two of them simply present a single scene. Uh, a single uh, six-tusked elephant is just about discernible amongst ordinary elephants. I don't know if you can just about see. So in fact, there's two depictions there, either side of the tree. Uh, this screen is uh, projecting them really well, actually, so that's nice. So you can see there are six-tusked elephants amongst ordinary elephants, and they're enjoying uh, a life of plenty, if you like. Um, the third does have discernible narrative content, so it does have uh, a scene of elephants frolicking in a lotus pool, which is very important to the story. Uh, and then you can also see the hunter just here with his bow and arrow, uh, about to shoot the king of elephants. And the presence of three separate images at this one site really intrigued me. There are only half a dozen stories chosen for depiction at Sanchi. Uh, and presumably this reflects a system of patronage and sponsorship that allowed the site to be constructed. So we can imagine different parts of the site being divided up and sponsored uh, and people having perhaps relatively free reign as to what they would like to be depicting. And while this system of patronage might explain why we've ended up with three images that appear to be of the same story, it doesn't actually explain why this particular story or why this particular uh, six-tusked elephant. And Sanchi isn't the only evidence of the story's popularity, as we've been discovering in recent weeks. Uh, as early as 1895, Léon Fier noted uh, in an article for the Journal Asiatique uh, the presence of five distinct textual versions of the story, um, these ones, uh, the Dhammapada commentarial story I've put in brackets just because it actually bears quite little resemblance to the rest. In a 1911 article, Alfred Fouché added a few more textual versions and also considered multiple artistic uh, depictions which helped him to advance a theory, largely a chronological theory, about how the different versions of the story developed. We can add now many more uh, textual and visual depictions, uh, including a really nice version in Haribata's Jatakamala, 
which is very similar in plot to the Pali Chidanta Jataka, but rather different in style. And you can see there's a really big range of, of different types of texts here. We've got Vinaya texts, we've got Jataka collections, we've got Avadana collections, uh, we've got uh, evidence of the popularity of the story in Central Asian uh, context. We've got it featuring in lists of uh, amazing past lives of the Buddha in the Khotanese Jataka Stava and also in the Mahayana Rastrapala Pariputra Sutra. So we're really finding this story all over the place. And we also find it associated with pilgrimage. So in Zhuangzang's travelogue, we find a little description of a pilgrimage site near Varanasi, uh, which is associated with the story. Uh, so you can see his little description of that uh, on the slide too. So we have this six-tusked elephant king uh, and a hunter who disguises himself in monk's robes. And then out of respect for the robe, the elephant king extracted its tusks and gave them to the hunter. So because of all these variants and occurrences, we decided to choose this story of the generous six-tusked elephant bodhisattva as a case study for an exploration of a wider question, which is the role of Jataka texts and images in Indian Buddhism. So we're going to be using this story to frame this lecture and to explore how we might study versions. I want to put versions in little scare quotes. Versions of stories both within textual sources and across the boundary between textual and visual Jatakas. I'm going to hand over to Chris for the next bit, so just excuse us while we do the microphone handover. Um, we're being recorded for posterity. I hope posterity appreciates it. Right. So um, the ideas that we would like to explore today and also in the seminar on Saturday have largely come out of an ongoing uh, research project on Jataka literature and art, uh, generously funded by the Lita Hume Trust. Uh, a major component of this research is uh, building an online searchable database of uh, Indian texts and art relating to the Jatakas. Um, so this uh, database will include uh, details from several Sanskrit collections and Pali collections. Uh, hopefully, eventually, we'll add uh, texts from other languages, uh, as well as the paintings and stone carvings of several artistic sites in India. Uh, one of the features of this database that we're especially excited by is the linking of parallel stories in texts and art. Uh, so this will allow the user to uh, explore different tellings of essentially the same story uh, across, across a wide variety of texts and also artistic sites. Um, so the process of judging um, you know, whether a story is a parallel version of another story has raised uh, a number of interesting questions, uh, such as what exactly is a parallel? How do we define that? Um, and why do these parallel stories even exist? So the uh, analysis of parallels uh, has, both in texts and maybe to a lesser extent in art, uh, has been a major methodological approach in Buddhist studies um, with scholars uh, analysing the similarities and differences of these stories and making assessments and even conclusions about the history of Buddhism. Uh, so therefore looking at you know, just the very notion of a parallel is a, you know, has broad relevance to the field. Um, so it might be helpful to firstly look at different types of parallels. Um, so here is a, a list, it's not by any means an exhaustive list, but, uh, so we have parallels within a text, um, parallels between different uh, texts ascribed to the same Buddhist school. <laughs> Often these will be in different uh, genres, and it's interesting to look at how these stories, how their different emphases in different genres. Uh, parallels between texts ascribed to different Buddhist schools. Uh, parallels between texts and images, um, which is what we're trying to do with the database in particular. Uh, parallels between different images found at a single artistic site and parallels between images found at different artistic sites. To this we could probably add quite a few more. 
Um, so it does, though, indicate a range of possibilities that is open to us uh, when we are looking for and analyzing parallels. So uh, first question is, what exactly do we mean by a parallel? Um, so different kinds of, I guess, genres of literature in, in Buddhism require different sets of criteria. Um, so, but in the case of uh, narrative stories in, uh, in Buddhist literature, uh, we're really mainly looking at uh, a strong similarity in the plot architecture of two or more stories. Um, so that is key storyline events in roughly the same sequence, um, having roughly the same characters. Um, other events seem less important. Uh, so for example, um, the particular names, the number of characters, so names of characters and places, uh, the literary style, the language, uh, even themes, we see um, parallels that have quite different themes, but they're clearly uh, very strongly related. So uh, let's take a closer look at the past life story of the six tusked elephant uh, that has already been briefly introduced. Uh, so we might begin with the perhaps the most well-known version of this story, the Pali version called the Chedanta Jataka. Uh, so the opening <coughs> narrative of this story um, begins at the time of Gautama Buddha uh, with a young nun who uh, remembers that in a previous rebirth she was an elephant queen. Uh, the Buddha notices her very animated sort of expressions <coughs> when she's having this recollection and he smiles and the Sangha asks him, you know, what's the cause of this smile and this uh, provides a reason for the telling of the um, past life story. So in this story, the Bodhisattva is previously, uh, he's reborn as an elephant king, um, very large, uh, white, and he has six tusks. Uh, so they live by the, um, a lake called Lake Chizanta in the Himalayas. Um, and so in parts of the story, he's described as having six tusks. In other parts of the story, uh, mainly the commentarial section, uh, he's, having, he's described as having two tusks with rays emanating from it with six colors. So there's a bit of ambiguity in the Pali version as to what's going on there. Uh, so one day uh, while frolicking in the forest, uh, he strikes a great sal tree in full bloom. And this causes flowers, green leaves, pollen uh, to fall upon one of his two elephant queens. And it also causes dry twigs, leaves and red ants to fall on the other elephant queen uh, who is infuriated by this, very unhappy. Uh, in a, another occasion, uh, they're playing in the Lake Chizanta uh, and the jealous elephant queen sees the elephant king uh, present a lotus flower to the other elephant queen. Um, this sort of you know, makes her even more upset. So what she does is, uh, after giving arms and um, flowers to a group of Pachega Buddhas, um, sometimes translated as solitary Buddhas, she makes a fervent aspiration uh, to be able to take revenge on the elephant king. So following this, she starves herself and dies, and she is reborn in a royal family as a human. Um, she uh, eventually becomes a queen, and she remembers her former life as a, uh, an elephant queen. She remembers her you know, uh, feelings of... Um, anger towards the, uh, the Bodhisattva, who is the Elephant King. So she manages to uh, convince the, her um, king, the human king, uh, to send a hunter to go and hunt down this um, six-tusked elephant and kill him and bring back the tusks. 
Uh, the, this hunter, we're later told, is none other than Devadasa, who um, is quite well known in Buddhist literature. Uh, he made several attempts to murder the Buddha uh, you know, in his final life as Gosama Buddha. Uh, so what happens is the, the hunter um, makes a long journey, uh, manages to find this uh, elephant king, and uh, shoots him with a poisoned arrow. Uh, the, the Elephant King then um, reacts with anger and grabs the hunter, but then he sees that there's an, he's wearing an ochre robe, um, which is a sign of asceticism. So he immediately um, backs off and you know, asks, you know, why did you shoot me? He finds out about the story of the, uh, the Elephant Queen being reborn as the Human Queen. And uh, so what he does is he offers his tusks to the hunter. Uh, so he, the hunter is unable to reach up because it's such a large elephant. Uh, so the, um, the Bodhisattva Elephant King has to kneel down. And uh, the hunter tries to saw off the tusks but is unable to. So then the Elephant King uh, takes the saw in his um, trunk and saws them off himself. Uh, so this eventually leads to the, the Elephant King dies, uh, the hunter returns back to the kingdom and uh, presents the six tusks to the, uh, the human queen, uh, who now is so sort of upset, she has deep remorse, and in fact she's so upset that she dies. So that's the story. Um, not a very happy ending. Um, so we have traced... So this is the, the Pali version. There are many other versions um, and there are many other stories that are clearly related. Um, that's an image of the Pali text side edition of the Chidanta Jataka. Uh, so this is uh, just a selection of some of these stories. This is um, the uh, versions that are preserved in Indic languages. Uh, so as you peruse this list, you may notice that there are quite a few differences in the details. Um, so what we might do is have a look at uh, just one of these stories. So we can look at the Hasti Jataka from Haribata's uh, Jataka Mala. So when we look at this, and on Saturday we'll actually be reading this uh, in the Sanskrit, uh, the, 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 pl the plot architecture is much the same as the Chidanta Jataka. Uh, has essentially the same storyline, the same events, um, same gen in general the same characters, um, but as you read the two stories side by side, um, quite major differences become apparent. Uh, so firstly, this telling is less gruesome uh, than the Pali version. Um, it's also less tragic in that the, uh, neither the, the Elephant King nor the, um, the human queen dies. Um, basically, it's a fairly happy ending. Um, secondly, the, um, the Hasti Jataka is composed in quite ornate Sanskrit kavya and is mainly in verse, uh, whereas the Chidanta Jataka is mainly in prose and it's in relatively unadorned, um, you know, uh, has a relatively unadorned style to it. Uh, thirdly, the Hasti Jataka begins and ends by praising the perfection of forbearance. So therefore, this story is quite literally framed uh, by this concern, whereas the Chidanta Jataka is relatively un unconcerned with uh, the perfections uh, and instead is mainly uh, concerned with um, multi-life uh, connections. Uh, providing several rebirth identifications. So the, the version of the Sanskrit Hasti Jataka only gives one um, uh, rebirth identification, so it's relatively unconcerned with this. So in the Chidanta Jataka, we have, even at the conclusion of the story, uh, we have the, uh, the, the young nun who was previously the elephant queen um, becomes awakened through listening to this story that she is intimately connected with. 
Uh, so these parallel uh, versions um, therefore seem to have quite different purposes. Um, in the case of the Hasti Jataka, a major purpose seems to be to entertain a highly educated uh, audience with a fine example of Sanskrit poetry, um, complete with uh, beautiful, uh, lucid visual imagery with similes, alliteration, the employment of several different meters. Um, and the story um, belongs to a fairly or well, a highly structured work, um, which is uh, you know where every story is presented as an example of a particular perfection that the Bodhisattva practiced in a previous life. Whereas the Pali version um, doesn't really discuss these perfections that much. So in order to get a better sense of what the Pali version is doing, we can take a look at uh, another um, related story. This is the um, Silva Naga Jataka, also in the Pali uh, collection of Jatakas. So in this story, uh, the Bodhisattva is reborn as a white elephant, a white elephant king living in the Himalayas. Uh, so the setting and the characters are quite similar. Uh, he sees a man lost in the forest um, and so he takes pity on him and he gives him food and shelter uh, and also leads him back to uh, the roads that leads to the city. Uh, so then later on this, um, this sort of forester uh, learns that ivory is highly sought after and will you know, fetch quite a large price in the city market. So. He goes back to the Himalayas and he asks the, um, the Elephant King for some ivory and the Elephant King is quite obliging. Um, so he agrees and he kneels down and lets the, um, the forester cut off some ivory. And uh, he takes this back to the city, sells it and uh, decides to get some more. So he goes back to the Himalayas and asks for some more ivory. Uh, the Bodhisattva again gives him some more ivory. He goes and sells this. And then for a third time, uh, he goes back to the Himalayas and asks for some ivory. Uh, so he then cuts off the, you know, the remaining section of, of the tusks. Uh, but when he leaves, the earth swallows him up as if it was unable to bear such terrible behavior. And we see sort of echoes of this in the story of Devadatta. So the, uh, the plot architecture of this story is quite uh, different, actually. Uh, so it's a matter of debate as to whether we'd actually call this a parallel story, um, perhaps not. Um, but they're very clearly related. There are passages, um, you know, short passages, which are you know, almost identical wording in the two uh, stories. Uh, so therefore, we might consider them to belong to a, a family, a shared family or cluster of stories. Uh, but categorizations aside, um, they're, despite their um, strong similarities, uh, they're actually doing quite different things. Uh, that is the Chidanta Jataka and the Silava Naga Jataka. So the uh, Chidanta Jataka is uh, largely focused on the elephant queen uh, and then when she's reborn as an, uh, a human queen and her subsequent regret. Um, while the later is mainly focused on Devadatta's um, multi-life ingratitude um, and lack of remorse. Uh, in fact, the story begins by saying, you know, here's a story about how Devadatta is always ungrateful. So to this uh, family of Jatakas from the Pali collection, we can add a third called the Kastava Jataka, uh, also up on this slide. Uh, despite telling a um, similar story, uh, the, this story is focused on the Bodhisattva's um, deep respect for the ochre robe as a symbol of asceticism. 
Uh, so these three different stories are really doing quite different things. They're exploring different themes, even though they're clearly um, from the same sort of cluster of texts. So this is uh, one sort of um, sort of usage, I suppose, of parallel stories. Uh, that is, they can explore different themes. Um, so in order to better understand such story families, it might be uh, helpful to turn to Ramona Chan's work on the many and varied uh, tellings of the Ramayana. Uh, he offers a wonderful metaphor uh, to explain their formation. Uh, so he refers to a large pool of signifiers uh, that include plots, characters, uh, names, geography, incidents, and relationships. Um, in which each author dips into and brings out a unique crystallization, a unique text with a unique texture and fresh context. I'm quoting directly here from one of his works. So this approach is quite helpful here, I think, because it challenges the potential implication that a parallel version is a variant of an invariant original exemplar uh, which is, of course, quite problematic. Um, it also uh, fits quite nicely with what we see with this family of stories about an elephant and his tusks, in that each of these tellings contains um, a select group of signifiers from a larger pool. So if we look at uh, now parallel passages, so we're kind of narrowing our focus, not from the sort of overall story, but to um, specific parts of stories. Uh, yet another picture seems to emerge. Uh, so for instance, in the Chidanta Jataka, the human queen uh, states that she dreamt of a white six-tusked elephant. And this uh, really echoes uh, the passages in which the uh, Queen Mahamaya dreams of a white six-tusked elephant uh, prior to the Bodhisattva's birth. Uh, similarly, in the Chidanta Jataka um, and the related Silvanaga Jataka, sorry, I've gone ahead too much. Um, so up on, up on this slide here, actually, uh, so the, the uh, elephant king states that the tusks of omniscience are more important to him than his physical tusks. And uh, this echoes a fairly well-known statement from the Sivi Jataka in which the Bodhisattva states that the eye of omniscience is much more valuable to him than his uh, physical eye. Uh, another example is that uh, Dhammapada versus nine to 10, um, state uh, th these verses are about the ochre robe and um, who is worthy of wearing the ochre robe. Uh, these are found in the, these very verses, word for word is found in the Chidanta Jataka, uh, the Kasava Jataka, and the Dhammapada commentary on these verses, which is also a related story. Um, there are hundreds of such examples uh, in which um, where we have these parallel passages uh, that join together at times uh, quite different parts of Buddhist literature to create complex networks uh, of ideas in which any given passage is likely to resonate uh, with several others, which creates multiple layers of meaning. So that's a bit of an exploration into the textual side of things. Uh, now let's look at the visual depictions of this family of stories. Okay, so now you all know the story. Let's get on to the art. Uh, so the pool of signifiers approach following Ramanujan uh, I think is really helpful when we start talking about visual jatakas as well. Uh, and I would say this is one of the reasons I prefer to think in this terms rather than more commonly the, the 
idea of intertextuality. I think the problem with intertextuality can be that we just get a little bit too focused on the texts, and I really want to bring in some of the other uh, manifestations of Jataka's uh, into the conversation. More commonly, the approach of, of thinking uh, with texts next to art, at least with Jataka's, has tended to be thinking in terms of chronology and influence, uh, perhaps seeking textual sources for images and using the more readily datable material forms as a way of shoring up the dating of texts, which are often more difficult to pin down. And the more standard approach to, to this uh, sort of work, as applied to the Chidanta story in particular, is well exemplified by uh, Alfred Fuchs' 1911 article that I already mentioned. Uh, he did a great job of identifying details in visual stories that he explored and using these to match the images up with uh, the textual versions. And in particular, he highlighted a key movement in the story from those versions in which the hunter saws off the tusks uh, with or without the elephant's help to those in which the elephant pulls his own tusks out, um, which Fuchsia notes that the elephant is also usually shown with only two tusks rather than six. And the two depictions in the Ajanta Caves, which I've put up here um, in line drawing form, uh, just for, for clarity, really. So the one on the left is the, uh, in the older caves, and the one on the right, uh, the slightly newer. Are we allowed to say newer for something that's first century? Uh, um, it's newer. Uh, these two images really illustrate that movement that Fisher is talking about. So we have uh, in cave 10 what is clearly a six-tusked elephant and a hunter with a saw. So you can sort of see that up on the top, uh, the hunter there with his little hand saw, such as I was used for pruning shrubs. And he's sawing through this cluster of three tusks, and we assume there are three on the other side, making six total. Uh, and then we get this movement uh, in the more recent image. We have a, an elephant with just two tusks. In fact, you can only really see one. Maybe he's already pulled the other one out and given it to the hunter. He's pulling this, he's wrapping his trunk around this tusk to extract it. Now, Fisher notes that this change reflects a textual shift with the likely innovation traced to uh, Ashwagosha's Sutra Lankara, and he makes a really nice little argument also um, about how this may help us explain the apparent disagreements between the earlier verses and the later prose of the Jatagatavanana version of the story, not least with respect to the question of how many tusks this elephant actually has. Now, in establishing the shifting textual presentation of the story and its influence on the art, Fuchsia does help us to understand some aspects of the history of this tale. And I really appreciate the work that, uh, that he's done on that. But um, I'm just going to you know, be a little bit selfish here and say that he doesn't really ask the questions that interest me when I think about these two images in Ajanta. For example, why was it decided to depict a story a second time in a neighboring cave, but with different details? Did people see it as the same story? And if they did, what did they make of the conflicting presentation? Did some people view it as a different past life that maybe had some similar aspects? Was the second image seen as a corrective to an earlier erroneous depiction? Did anybody actually even care? Apart from perhaps the artists, who presumably did care about their work, and the patrons, what exactly was depicted? Could anybody even see the story's details in the dark of the caves? How actually did users of cave these caves interact with the images that were painted within them? What, in sum, was the point of depicting this story at all, let alone twice? Now, um, I freely acknowledge that many of these questions are completely unanswerable, but I would argue that they're still worth asking. And I would suggest that this pool of signifiers approach might help us to start to think about some of the things that might be going on. So uh, another table for you, this one of uh, Indian artistic depictions of the story. Um, I've also made you a, a not terribly elegant map, just in case you don't know where these sites are. So we're talking about quite a lot of different regions here. So we've got the Barahut and Sanchi Stupas in uh, Madhya Pradesh. Uh, we've got uh, Gandharan art right from up, up in the northwest. And I should say, I've only got one example on here, but I believe that Jason Neelis and his recent project has found a second, which I haven't had a chance to, uh, to look at yet. Uh, we've got the Ajanta Caves uh, in Maharashtra, um, the uh, Andhra Pradesh sites, Amravati and Goli, and then the Kanagana Hali Stupa, which is a relatively recent discovery in Karnataka. So we're talking about a pretty um, impressive range of sites. So uh, some interesting things are immediately apparent. First of all, the association with the idea of respecting men in robes, 
which does seem to be quite an important theme in a lot of the textual versions of the story or textual stories that cluster around this family of stories uh, and that have wider resonances in, for example, the Dhammapada and some of the other Jatakas that Chris was just speaking about, just doesn't seem to be important in the art. There is no image that I found that really clearly shows that the hunter is dressed in any way that we might recognize as being ochre robes or monastic or Pacheka Buddha-like or anything of that sort. And in many, it's really clear that he's not. A second thing that emerges is uh, the question of whether or not the Bodhisattva helps the hunter seems to be quite important to the art. Uh, so in almost every depiction, we see the elephant helping, either by lowering himself to a more accessible height or uh, helping the hunter saw by gripping the saw in his trunk, or as we've seen in the Ajanta image, actually pulling his own tusks out, although that's actually the only um, example of that that I've found in this early materials. Now, the other thing that has really struck me as I've looked at this material is that many of the depictions, not all of them, but many of them seem to be really concerned to show the human queen's regret as a central feature. And quite a lot of them also include the gift of a lotus that is the cause of the initial jealousy of the elephant queen and the, the source of her desire for revenge in her next life. So this multi-life animosity of the queen seems to be a real concern in these sites, as it is for, for some of the textual occurrences as well. So those scenes were depicted in both of the Ajanta uh, depictions. Um, we also can see them here in this depiction of the story uh, across three uh, dome stabs at Kanagana Hulli. I'm really grateful to Monica Zinn for sharing her line drawings of this uh, material. So you can see uh, on the left we have the lotus pools, the elephants playing in the lotus pools and the gift. And we also have the queen uh, both up here and up here. Uh, she's fainting at the sight of the tusks being presented to her. Uh, so we get this sort of sense that this multi-life interaction is important for um, the artists. Uh, this is also the case uh, at, uh, in the relief from Goli. Um, so here again, we, and we even have a separation here between the image of the hunter sawing off the tusk with the elephant's help and the presentation of the tusks to the queen, and she's fainting. And the same thing is true of nearby Amaravati. The, this, for some reason, this image has gone peculiar uh, in the journey from Scotland. Um, but you can still see the image uh, that's important here. So this roundel from Amaravati, which is quite well known. Uh, it's one of Vijay Deheja's uh, selected examples of a synoptic narrative. So she maps out the different scenes, six different scenes shown within a single image. Uh, and that's all the adventures of the elephant uh, and the hunter. But actually, there's a, a second roundel. Um, and again, I've taken this line drawing from, from Shingloff's um, really helpful set of comparative imagery in his uh, Ajanta handbook. And here we see the other half of the story. We see the human queen, again, fainting uh, in the arms of the, the, uh, her human husband uh, as she's being presented by these tusks um, from this hunter. Bit of a curious question about how many tusks there are here, by the way, uh, because in the first image, he seems to, the elephant seems to have a couple of two tusks, but then the hunter is carrying four tusks away but then seems to only have two again by the time he presents them to the queen. So I'm not really sure what's going on there. It's an intriguing uh, question. So these patterns in terms of how choices were made about which elements of the story to include and which to emphasize, I think can give us some insight into the potential reasons for depicting the story. And one of the things that really intrigues me about uh, visual materials is that they tend to offer far less uh, help for us in terms of explicit rationales for uh, why they're including the story. So, for example, the textual sources for this story often tell us quite clearly why they're including the story. And there are, broadly speaking, three categories of reasons. Uh, so they may be including the story as an illustration of multi-life bonds, the dangers of multi-life animosity. They may well be telling us the story because it illustrates some great quality of the Bodhisattva, though quite which quality varies from text to text. 
Uh, there's also this important theme of respect for the robe, which I've mentioned is, is quite prominent in several of the, the stories. And then a fourth theme that we might bring in, or fourth reason, uh, depending on what we count as a version of this story, is this uh, issue of David Utter's ingratitude and or his wearing of robes when he doesn't deserve to do so. The images, though, as I've uh, tried to, to show, really only address the first two. So we do get this multi-life message underscored by the frequent inclusion of the gift of the lotus, which causes the elephant queen's jealousy, and the human queen fainting at the sight of the tusks being brought by the hunter. The general awesomeness of the Bodhisattva elephant is highlighted in the images that show him helping the hunter uh, being so willing in the gift of his own body part. And the other associations just don't seem to be discernible. Now, this is just one story. Um, I appreciate that. But I do think it's still worth noting that both multi-life karmic bonds and the Buddha's perfection are relevant to our understanding of stupa sites in early India. So, for example, as uh, Jonathan Walters explored at some length, the idea that all devotees are tied to the Buddha through these sorts of complex karmic networks that are often demonstrated in Jataka and Avadana or Apatana literature is important to the role of uh, the rise in stupa devotion. And the presence of the Buddha as a perfected being uh, is ensured not only by the relics enshrined in the stupa, but also potentially through images uh, that depict him or his relics or his stupas. And as Robert Brown argued in the very same volume, it's one of my favorite books, uh, it's got so much interesting material in there. Uh, Robert Brown argued in the same volume, Jataka images as part of this uh, format at sites, they're often inaccessible, they're too far overhead, you can't see them, they're hidden away in dark caves, in some places they're even covered over. Uh, and this suggests that their presence uh, has little relation to narrative readings. The, the depictions of Jatikas are not being read as stories. Uh, rather, they're making the Buddha present or manifesting the qualities of Buddhahood in some way. So they're functioning as part of this uh, nexus of relic image text that plays out in such fascinating ways throughout the Buddhist world. And these two approaches have really influence my own understanding of Jatakas and visual contexts. To bring it back to Jadanta in particular, seeing that the aspects of the story that signify multi-life bonds and the Bodhisattva's ability to transcend these through his perfect compassionate generosity are made so prominent in these depictions might help us to understand how that works, how these Jatakas are bringing things to these sacred sites. And it might even help us to understand the uh, site with which we began the lecture, namely Sanchi, which was really what got me first intrigued about this whole uh, set of stories in the, in the beginning. Because here we have depictions that have been identified as the Chadanta Jataka that feature six dust elephants, uh, and yet there's not really any narrative going on. So what's going on? There's no multi-life bonds, there's no demonstration of generosity, patience, or compassionate self-sacrifice. Why, why do we have these images? What are they doing? So uh, the first suggestion I have is that, of course, the six tusked elephant has wider associations with virtue and power. So as Chris noted earlier, the elephant that enters Maya's side in her dream and that marks the conception of the Bodhisattva in his final life is often described as having six tusks, although I note that it's not generally depicted as such, which is an interesting aspect. I'd be uh, very keen to hear if people have uh, examples where it is depicted as six tusked. Uh, the divine elephant of the god Indra, or Chakra, is also six-tusked in a lot of uh, sources. Uh, and of course, the Bodhisattva as elephant is never going to be an ordinary elephant. So this is symbolized by the additional tusks, but also by the fact that he's white in color. And as we all know, white elephants don't exist. So they do. So I would suggest that at Sanchi, and, and perhaps elsewhere, and indeed the image that uh, Christian found for the seminar on Saturday uh, of a Kashmiri six-tusked elephant, this may be just emblematic of these qualities and virtues, and even without the narrative content. In fact, maybe these images don't depict the Chadanta Jataka at all, but only the central character therein. And so very much bringing us back to Brown's uh, assessment that these Jataka narratives, Jataka images are not being read as narratives. The notion of sacred place might be important as well. So the Sanchi depictions uh, all include this magnificent uh, tree that is described in the Pali Jataka as being situated beside Lake Jadanta in the Himalayas, 
at the foot of seven magical mountains. The sort of idea of magical landscape is really important to several of the textual versions of the story. And this association with the presence of Pacheca Buddhas or of Munis, this uh, association with uh, renunciatory bliss maybe is being brought to this site. Uh, and that may re resonate with some of the other images that are found at Sanchi of sacred sites, stupa worship, pilgrimage, and the like. But finally, and um, let's be honest here, I do think it's perfectly possible that the reason we see so many images of Chidanta at Sanchi might be at least in part because donors and artists really enjoyed elephants. Uh, who doesn't? Uh, there are so many elephants depicted at Sanchi. Uh, in fact, you can see some of them here uh, on the edges that are not part of the, uh, the, the lintel. I very much doubt that any visitors to Sanchi would be able to tell that some of the elephants depicted have six tusks rather than the usual two. Um, in fact, they probably can't even tell the difference between the tree in the middle of that image and the tree in the middle of this image, for example, on a different gateway where we just simply have animals worshipping uh, the Bodhi tree. But that doesn't matter. So the whole point, I suppose, that I'm trying to make here is that it, it doesn't matter whether they see or whether they recognize the six-tusked Bodhisattva elephant because the patrons and the artists have ensured that this generous and compassionate elephant paragon of virtue literally watches over the devotees as they come and go through the gateways. The next two paragraphs belong to Chris, but we decided we wouldn't switch over the microphones again. So I'm just going to tell you what's going on, um, reaching some concluding thoughts. So this very brief exploration of the Chidanta Jataka has actually barely scratched the surface of the many sources available to us. Uh, we will be discussing some more of them in Saturday's seminar if you're interested in talking more. And if you know of more that we haven't found yet, we'd really love to hear from you as well. But we hope that even this short reflection on this one story has demonstrated the value of studying textual and visual narratives side by side. And also the value of asking rather different questions of them to those that have been quite frequently asked in the past. And in particular, thinking in terms of Ramanujan's pool of signifiers can offer us something different to those studies that focus on versions, chronologies, textual sources. It helps us to appreciate the many different sorts of parallels and resonances that exist across the vast body of Jataka literature and it's an approach that can be applied across visual and textual culture. Paying attention to the visual culture helps us to understand not only what is being depicted, but also why. And this can then inform our understanding of textual narrative too, so it becomes a bit of a feedback loop. And that's not to suggest that textual and visual narratives always have the same function uh, or focus, that's clearly not the case. But it is important, I think, to remember that we can only fully understand the Jataka genre, or indeed other genres that exhibit similar plurality, such as uh, Rama literature, uh, without taking into account the various forms in which the genre is present. And these forms are material and visual as well as textual. And so a proper exploration of how they relate to one another requires more than simply trying to identify a textual source for a visual version or a material date for an undateable text. And I should note, uh, perhaps I should have noted at the beginning of this lecture, that in doing this sort of work, I'm not making any pretense at, at being an art historian myself. I very much believe in uh, the idea that scholarship is a team sport and that we should all be working together. And I'm, I've learned a lot from reading art historical scholarship. Uh, and also we do have uh, both a little symposium later in the year where we'll be bringing together textual scholars and art scholars uh, to talk about Indian Buddhist narrative. But also we've got some art historians advising on the database project. So um, I'm not... I'm not trying to become an art historian, but I do hope that it's uh, been a, an interesting exploration. Uh, the idea of studying the signifiers and themes within stories is, uh, and the insistence of, of looking across text and art are very much central to the, the Jataka database project uh, that is at the, the heart of this research. We are going to have to decide uh, what constitutes a parallel story for the purposes of this one particular linking feature in the database. But we're also making it possible to search for different aspects. So, for example, you'll be able to look for all the stories that feature a six-tusked elephant uh, or that mention Lake Chidanta, uh, all the stories that address Devadutta's bad behavior or false asceticism uh, or the dangers of women. Uh, spoiler alert, there's quite a lot of those. Uh, or the unparalleled perfection of the Bodhisattva. Spoiler alert, there's fewer of those than you might imagine. And the search results will include not only stories and textual sources, but also visual jatikas at a range of early Indian sites. 
So we're still in the early stages of making this available. We were hoping to be able to show you a prototype, but it's not quite ready. Um, but the research possibilities that are thrown up by this project are already starting to present themselves. And as Chris mentioned, we're, um, I'm hoping that future rounds of development of the database will be uh, widened to include Chinese, Tibetan, and other Jataka traditions, including the copious vernacular Jatakas of Southeast Asia. Uh, but while the Jataka database may have future episodes, uh, that's the end of today's snippet of the rich Jataka literature for you today. Thank you very much. <laughs>